Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and little sleepy girl here is Cindy Oliver and she's a dog. Now I'm afraid that this video is a bit of a mea culpa. A few weeks ago we made a video about how upset Dr. John Campbell was about the ONS changes because they would limit his opportunities for grifting about excess deaths. And during that video, we made a claim that turned out to be wrong. Let's have a listen. John is so upset about the ONS changes curtailing his grifting, he's forgotten to mention that this isn't the ONS data. Whereas the ONS data uses the previous five years, excluding months with high COVID deaths as a baseline, this data set is using 2015 to 2019 as the baseline. And the reason for this is that the purpose of this database was to look at excess mortality above what would have been expected if the pandemic hadn't occurred. Sadly for John, this will no longer be updated. So there are no further grifting opportunities here either. So when Cindy and I made this video, I thought the fact that the database wasn't going to be updated anymore would mean that John could no longer use it for grifting. Boy, was I wrong. We've been looking at data for a long time from the Office for Health Improvements and Disparities. Uh, that's the reference for that there. But when you go on the site today, this is what came up. This analysis is no longer being updated. Data covers the 20th of March 2020, fair enough, to the 29th of December 2023. They are not updating this data for 2024. Why on earth would a government department not want to monitor why its people are dying? This really is difficult to explain and um, it's enough to make you feel a little bit paranoid, actually. But of course, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to, to get you. But that really is quite incredible that we've got this time of excess deaths. And of course, the Office for National Statistics has just changed the way it monitors excess deaths. And that has dramatically reduced the apparent excess deaths throughout 2023. Made no difference at all, of course, to the amount of people that died and the grieving relatives. That's made no difference at all, but it looks better doesn't look as bad on the government now, presumably, because throughout 2023, it now looks as if many fewer excess people have died. But of course, it's made no difference at all. Uh, that's what's done. And now the Office for Health Improvements and Disparities seems to be also, um, shall we say, not giving us all the data we would like. So for probably the last time, let's look at their data, because after this it's not being updated. This will be the last one. In hindsight, it should have been obvious that John would use the fact that the database was being discontinued as an excuse to bang on about conspiracies and talk about the data yet again. I didn't consider it because the notice was already on the website when he made the last video talking about the exact same data. I didn't think he would be so blatant as to pretend a few weeks later that he was now seeing it for the first time. Of course, I should have known better. And for that, I apologise. But I do have some wonderful news for John. He is wrong that the data isn't going to be updated at all. We will still know what people are dying from and whether the deaths are more than or less than expected. The new database will be looking at excess mortality within England in the post-pandemic period, whereas the previous database was looking at excess mortality above what would have been expected if the pandemic hadn't occurred. In other words, the new methodology takes into consideration the fact that direct and indirect deaths from COVID mean that the baseline rate of deaths is now higher than what it was prior to the pandemic. So the expected death rate is calculated from the previous five years, excluding months with particularly high COVID deaths. And speaking of COVID deaths, in his video, John tries to claim that a lot of the COVID deaths weren't really COVID deaths. 
I won't show you the clip because his claims are too disgusting to repeat. But this is a common anti-vaxxer tactic of trying to rewrite history to downplay the seriousness of COVID to fit their narrative. Now, I'm not going to predict whether or not John will choose to show this new information, given how often he has spoken about excess deaths in the past, you would think he would want to continue informing people about them, but I'm not going to fall into the trap of predicting what it will do again. Anyway, at the time I am recording this video, he hasn't shown this new data yet, so I will give you a quick rundown. These two charts show information on overall excess mortality. The top chart shows excess mortality by month in light turquoise and reduced mortality in dark aqua. The bottom chart shows monthly registered deaths in navy blue and the expected deaths are shown by the orange dotted line. We can see that excess deaths have been negative since July 2023, but there was a spike in January 2023, and this trend is consistent across all age groups with the exception of those 0 to 24. For 0 to 24, there are currently excess deaths for all months except for November 2023. Although if you look at the scale, you can see that the absolute numbers are thankfully very low. They also provide data by underlying cause of death, which is something that John usually likes to speak about. So we will look at that now for him. So firstly, we have circulatory diseases, which includes both cardiovascular and cerebrovascular diseases, as well as thrombosis or blood clots. And as with mortality overall, excess deaths have been negative since July 2023, but they were much higher in January 2023. Next up is ischemic heart disease, and this includes myocardial infarction, which is commonly known as heart attack. Again, we see that excess mortality has been negative since July 2023. Cerebrovascular diseases include stroke. And again, we see a spike in January 2023 with subsequent months showing some excess mortality until August 2023. Then there is a small excess again in September and October before going negative again in November. Cancer deaths have been mostly above expected until September 2023 and have since been negative. It's a bit of a different story for influenza and pneumonia deaths, which also includes COVID pneumonia. We see the large spike in excess mortality in January 2023 that was seen in overall mortality, but excess mortality continues for all months except January 2024. Actual deaths were still high in January 2024 compared with other months, but not as high as expected. And a similar pattern is seen for chronic lower respiratory diseases. We also have a large spike in dementia and Alzheimer's deaths in January 2023, and they are above expectations for most months. And finally, for cirrhosis and other liver diseases, we see that excess mortality has been negative since June 2023. The data set also shows excess mortality by region, sex, and level of deprivation. And it will be updated monthly. So plenty of opportunities if you just want to make videos genuinely updating people about mortality levels in England but not so many opportunities if your aim is to peddle disinformation about excess deaths. This really is difficult to explain, and um, it's enough to make you feel a little bit paranoid, actually. But of course, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to, to get you. But that really is quite incredible that we've got this time of excess deaths. 
of these excess deaths. Excess deaths. Excess deaths. The excess deaths. Excess deaths in the United Kingdom. Excess deaths. Excess deaths in Europe. Excess deaths. So we see there's quite a lot of excess deaths. We want to look at excess deaths today. Now, John seems to be taking the discontinuation of the previous data set a bit personally and suggesting that the reason for the discontinuation is some huge conspiracy. But he's failing to understand why the database was created. It wasn't created to provide fodder for his videos. It was created because it's well known that epidemics of infectious diseases are associated with excess deaths beyond those deaths attributed directly to the disease. So this data set was a way to monitor those deaths. And in fact, we see in the new data set when influenza and pneumonia deaths are particularly high in January 2023, we also see excess deaths from other causes as well. Now that mortality associated with COVID is more predictable, we need to be able to monitor deaths that are still above what is expected so that they can be investigated. But it's okay, John has a new thing to bang on about, courtesy of Andrew Bridgen. He is now trying to pin long-term sickness on COVID vaccines. Let's have a listen. Let's watch the speech now, then we'll give the evidence. Andrew Bridgen, the number of long-term sick has risen from 2.1 million pre-pandemic to 2.8 million today. The huge increase started in spring 2021 at the same time as the rollout of the experimental uh, emergency use vaccines. Or does the minister have an alternative explanation for the unprecedented rise in long-term sickness in the UK since spring 2021? Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, in fact, the, one of the major drivers of uh, this uh, increase to which the Honourable Gentleman refers is actually mental health issues, musculoskeletal issues as well. And I think I'm not entirely sure that he's accurate when he says that the upward trajectory in those numbers actually occurred just as vaccination occurred. I think it predated that moment. And I certainly do not subscribe to the view uh, that vaccination is in any way unsafe. So let's look at the references for that, as we always do. Uh, this is available on Mr. Bridgen's Twitter site, and it's also available on his uh, YouTube channel, as are several other um, official narrative challenging videos, which of course is good. How can senior politicians still stand up and say COVID vaccines are safe? It really is incredible. The kind of doubling down on this. So, so when the truth is finally revealed about what's going on here and the level of adverse reactions, really, it's going to be. Well, I can't imagine what's going to happen. Anyway, let's um, look at this. So that's the tweet there. Long-term sick has risen by over 700,000 people since the spring of 2021. This coincides with the rollout of the experimental COVID-19 vaccines. Now, the minister questioned this. Now, here's evidence from the Heart Group, Health Advisory and Recovery Team. And of course, there's the reference. Now, they put forward a couple of graphics here. Um, economically inactive because of long-term sickness. Yes, you heard that right. John's sources are a tweet from an anti-vax politician and a blog post from an anti-vax organisation. How about we go to the actual official source instead? This is a data from the ONS Labour Force Survey. And as you can see, the Minister is right and John Campbell, Andrew Bridgen and the Hart Group are wrong. The increase clearly started in 2019, before the vaccines or the pandemic, and has been increasing ever since. The minister was also correct that mental illness and musculoskeletal problems account for a lot of the increase. There is also a substantial increase in what is classified as other, and this classification includes long COVID. And we also know that the rate of workforce inactivity grew more quickly amongst people who self-reported long COVID than those who didn't. But of course, it's not all long COVID. Another contribution is the ageing population as the baby boomers approach retirement. This changing age distribution in working age people 
was estimated to add about 40,000 people to those expected to become inactive owing to long-term sickness between 2019 and 2022, which is significant, but again, not the whole story. Another important contributor is NHS waiting lists. This flew out to 7.4 million in May 2023, up from 4.6 million in January 2020. And in fact, a recent survey showed that 33% of people who were inactive in the workforce were waiting for NHS treatment. So the increasing trend in long-term sickness predates the pandemic and has a number of identified causes, none of which are related to vaccines. All this information is readily available from the ONS, but John chose to ignore it and instead showed a tweet and an anti-vax blog. So it looks like I was also wrong that inconvenient official statistics would curtail John's grifting. He is happy to ignore them and switch to unreliable sources. If you'd like to look further into the data I've presented, I provided links in the video's description. And please remember, this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. If you've got this far, thank you for listening. And if you've liked, shared or commented on the video, double thank you because that helps the algorithm and means that more people will see the video. And of course, thank you to everyone who has bought me a coffee or little Cindy a treat. And should we wake her up and give her a treat? Yeah, let's do that. Here's a treat, Cindy. Here we go. We really appreciate your support. We will be continuing to make videos about the science in the future. So if you'd like to join the cool kids and stay informed, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.